people that you're talking to have been attacked from all sides by a hundred different cold callers in a hundred different ways. So they've been attacked by the wolves, they're in, they're in the trenches. And in order to stand out, you have to be a sheep. You have to be calm. That's and true. ultimately, at the end of the day, I tell people, I tell them this line and it works magic. You have to treat people like people and not a number. I said, that's what makes us different. We treat people like people first, numbers later. What's going on? This is Brett Snodgrass, and we are back with another episode of the Indie Investor Podcast. I have Wade Hodges on the podcast with me today. What's going on, Wade? Not much, man. Just happy to be here. Yeah, man. Super excited uh, for you to be on this particular podcast. We've gotten to know each other pretty well over the last year. Wade it actually works with a simple team. He came in as a lead manager, and that's really what we're going to be talking about today, um, why this role is so important. And if you really think about someone just on the front lines, uh, sometimes the person that is maybe leading the ship. Um, they don't get to see everything happening on the front lines, but really the front lines is where everything starts. And if you don't have a good person in this particular seat of a lead manager, then your business is going to fall apart before it even begins, because this is literally where it starts. A lot of you guys listening might not even know what a lead manager is, honestly. Um, we're going to talk about that and what a lead manager is, why it's so important. But but Wade, um, before we get in, man, let's just talk about you. So Wade Hodges, tell us about you, man. What, what's your background uh, and before you got into the Simple Team? Yeah, so um, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I'm excited to, to be able to talk about um just what an asset a lead manager can be. Um, my background it has nothing to do with real estate. <laughs> uh, I was a rookie coming in, had no idea about anything. Um, still comparatively to some people don't know Jack Squat, but uh, my background, uh, I was actually a certified uh, music therapist before I came in. Um, that was the degree that I chose in college. That's what I pursued. And for three years before coming onto the simple team, that's what I was doing. Um, so it just, I was a therapist. So all of your cliche thoughts about what a therapist is like, that's pretty much what it was like. Um, I worked with special needs, children and adults. So it was a little bit different, um, a little bit of a niche um, population, but I really did enjoy it. Um, until I just kind of lost my passion for it. And uh, the opportunity here with the Simple Team just kind of fell in my lap. A uh, friend of a friend of, of yours <laughs> kind of <laughs> introduced us. And uh, the rest is history, I suppose. Yeah. No, it's, a, it's quite, yeah. So Wade actually leads worship at a church that my wife and our family have attended regularly. And that's how we got involved. I have a friend that goes to the church and... <laughs> Uh, I think you were chatting with him. You guys became friends, said you were interested in wholesaling, I think, and real estate and introduced yep. myself. And I didn't honestly know how this would all go. Um, and then here we are, just celebrate a year with a simple team and uh, super, just a huge asset for us. Um, and you've just grown uh, so much. Um, so Wade, let's just talk about this position, number yep. one. Uh, so let's talk about what do you do? <laughs> like what's your what's your day look like every yeah. week as a lead manager? It's a good question. Um, so what I do um, now has shifted from what I did to begin with. Um, so when I started, actually before I was even part of the Simple Team, what I was doing was making cold, 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 cold calls. Um, to basically making calls from a dead list, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're and like, so we gave late Wade the list. They're like, these people tell us to get <laughs> lost. They never answer the phone, nothing. Like, they're so cold and, and dead. Yeah. So here you go. See, see if you, what you can do with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was, that was pretty much how that conversation <laughs> went. Um, and I didn't hate that. So essentially, the, you guys were like, uh, well, if you don't hate that, you're going to really love what you get to do. <laughs> so essentially what I do is... Um, 
I follow up to begin my day. I follow up with sort of the older leads in the system that are attached to my name and um, have the ability to even go into other categories of leads that are not in my name, just some older ones in our system and be able to just follow up with those people, try and drum up maybe um, old leads that are in our system and kind of make them new, um, kind of to push them through our our process and then ones that have been sent to us by our cold call team or our um, launch control system to just nurture those um, and help them to grow and, and push them through our system as well. So that's kind of the first part of my day as well as meetings throughout the week for training and development and um, camaraderie and through, within the team um, and replying to emails, all of those sort of administrative things that that kind of happens in the morning time. Um, that's what I call my follow-up time. And then my back half of the day is taking incoming leads. So those leads that I was talking about that are getting sent to us from the cold callers and from our launch control uh, system, they actually come into uh, Salesforce as new leads and I will contact them and kind of do the same thing, um, but they're new in the system and not have been sitting there for mm -hmm. months, weeks, days, or whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So a lot of your time is obviously spent on the phone, um, what, how, how many calls a week would you say that you that you partake in? How many conversations? Oh gosh, um, tons of conversations. Whether they're initial conversations or follow up conversations, um, I may have two to three conversations with the same person in a day, just because it was a bad time or something came up. Um, or they have questions or I need to follow up or whatever the, the case may be. Um, but I shoot for each week to be between 250 and 300 calls made. Um, and then within that, just however many people I can talk to, it varies um, mm -hmm. depending on the week, depending on the day, the season even can have an impact on uh, how many people I actually get to talk to. Mm -hmm. Um, but I try and, and make attempts, um, about 250 to 300 times a week. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you're on the phone a lot, having constant conversations, whether that's the initial conversation, someone uh, that's calling us, maybe they received a letter in the mail, maybe they yeah, saw maybe. our website, maybe they received another cold caller. So we, ha we do still have people that do those dead lists, those, those really, really cold, cold lists. Uh, and maybe they scraped up something and then they hand it off to you. So you're on the phone a lot, uh, constantly having conversations, constantly nurturing leads. And so my question was this, I mean, you came from the therapy background and now you're in this, which sometimes we kind of, I don't know if we joke around about it, but it's, it's very similar as far as your helping solve problems because uh, so, typically the people that are motivated have some sort of a problem in their life that they're trying to solve and that's where you might be able to come in and solve so there are some similarities there uh okay. i want to ask you is like what were you expecting i guess with this particular role i mean what was some of your um coming into real estate you're a rookie don't really know what to expect you start off with this dead list now you've been in a year what were maybe some of the things you were thinking and some of the expectations coming into maybe our company and, and, and this role. Yeah. Um, and maybe how is it different too? You can go that way. Yeah, certainly. I don't know if I had any intentional um, kind of thoughts or, or expectations about what it was going to be like. Um, it was a completely new field that I had never even thought about touching um, seriously. Um, so I didn't really know anything about it. And so I knew it was going to be a huge learning curve for me, um, or I thought it would be initially. Um, so that may have been my first expectation was, man, I don't know anything. I'm going to have to learn all of these things and really increase in my knowledge of this field that I know nothing about. Mm -hmm. And then given my initial task before I was officially hired onto the team with those dead leads, I... I don't know if I expected or if maybe I just assumed that that was going to be what I was experiencing of, you know, I, I make, you know, a hundred calls a day or 50 calls a day and I don't have a single conversation because nobody wants to answer the phone mm -hmm. or 
whatever it may be. Um, how it is different is none of that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have lots of conversations with people and some of them are good. Some of them are bad and some of them start bad, but I turn them good. Mm. Um, it's interesting. And, <laughs> and uh, not knowing anything actually was my biggest tool mm. because I wasn't having to relearn anything coming from a real estate background, having to relearn how to do things or relearn terminology or relearn a strategy. So I was coming in fresh like a sponge so I could just soak it all in and then immediately apply, mm -hmm. which is what I've been able to do Yeah, um, through the, through the leadership and the building up of, of kind of how our team is structured. So those are sort of my sort of my loose expectations, and then how it changed is everything that I thought was wrong, yeah, and then in a completely different in a good way. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for. There's a couple things I want to dig into there that you said. Uh, so number one, you said not knowing anything was my biggest tool. I think a lot of people get hung up. They think they have to learn everything before they can get started. Um, and typically this particular role, this lead manager role, is how most real estate investors start. That's how I started. I sent out some letters. I called some people. That's typically, you're sitting in the role where this really, it all starts. Like we said, guys, uh, this is on the front lines. This is, if you don't have this and you're not having conversations with sellers, then you, you don't really have a business. So this is all where it starts. And this is where most real estate investors start. But you said that not knowing anything was your, was your biggest tool. Um, can you kind of just dig into that a little bit, a little bit more and maybe encourage those that feel like they, they need to continuously learn and they're just stuck because they don't know enough yet. I say, you know, coming in, knowing nothing was one of my biggest tools that I used because I used it to my advantage. Mm. Uh, I didn't have to, like I said, I didn't have to get around roadblocks of old ways, old habits, old sales positions that may have been different, that may have been more, you know, pushy or, you know, you know push for the close, always be closing mm -hmm. that mindset. I didn't have to reshape myself to not think that way. Mm -hmm. I was a blank, a blank sheet of paper, mm -hmm. essentially. So, and I knew nothing. When I say I knew nothing, I knew nothing. <laughs> the only thing that I came into this position knowing how to do was dial a number on a phone. Mm. So as far as, you know, talking to people in a, in a sales type position and in, or in a real estate world. So I knew nothing. Mm. And that was actually really cool because it gave me a reason to want to learn. Mm -hmm to want to continue to grow, to want to learn everything that I possibly can about this world, the terminology, the different types of paperwork, all of those things that are kind of high level. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn those things. I was excited to learn those things because it was completely new. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, I wasn't jaded to this world at all because again, I was like a, a newborn. Mm -hmm. I was a baby in this world. Yeah. So, you know, no, that being okay. where I started was invaluable. Mm -hmm. No, I love that. You said you came in as a, as a blank sheet of paper and I always just, you're, you've been very coachable. Uh, you didn't come in with, yeah, some of those biased opinions and, uh, we used to do it this way. I mean, you probably hear that at other companies. Oh, back at, at, you know, whatever homes are us, uh, we used to do it this way. So, um, you don't have to do that. You're very coachable. And I think that's a really awesome thing that we look for in uh, our team is, is, are they coachable? Um, do they have humility? Right. Um, and they don't have to have all the answers. So I love that. Uh, one thing that you also said was one of your jobs is to try to turn bad conversations into good. So I think one of the scariest parts about this particular role, whether someone says it or not, I know I have a lot of fear of just the negativity that I might receive from this particular role. And that really clams a lot of people up. No one wants to be uh, yelled at or uh, sure. viewed in a negative light. And 
and that weighs on people. So like, man, I don't want to do that, that calling, uh, and answering the phone because what if they're going to be mad at me and yell at me or even cuss at me and, and, and all that. Right. And that's just, that's just around, around this position. Um, but one thing, so let's just start there. So sometimes the conversations start bad and how do you handle that? What, what's your response Mm. and how can you encourage someone else in that same position to keep going and, and make it, try to make it more positive and then you can even turn that into trying to make it good. Yeah. So I think in this specific lane of this job and this role, my therapy experience actually helped me quite a bit Mm. Um, because I was working, like I said, with special needs, children and adults. So I was prone to being physically attacked. That background actually helped me because I was, I was more prepared to deal with being physically attacked Mm. so that there was a barrier there for me to say, okay, I am safe. Their words may be aggressive, but they're not actually going to physically hit me in the face. (laughs) They may yell at me. They may curse at me. They not, they may not be really happy to talk to me, but I, I can talk to them and I can talk my way, you know, through a maze, right? I I have the ability to just talk with that therapist Mm -hmm. role of just being able to talk through people's problems, calm them down a lot of the times. Um, And it's, there there is a um, a theory in therapy called the ISO principle. Mm -hmm. It's effectively in layman's turn, it it means meeting them where they're at. Um, And if somebody approaches me really aggressively, I may not want to meet them aggressively because in a professional setting, probably not appropriate, Mm -hmm. but I do want to meet them with understanding and I want to meet them with empathy and I want to meet them with actually the reverse of what they're giving me Mm. in that instance. I don't want to apply the ISO principle. If they're coming into me and they're talking, you know, they're really, really excited. And they're like, yeah, I had a great conversation with your assistant, which is what I call the cold callers. I call them my assistants. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I had a great conversation. I'm really excited to talk to you guys, blah, blah, blah. Or I heard about you on the TV. I think this is a really cool opportunity. Then I meet them there. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. What, like, how can we help you? Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about what you've got going on. I can meet them there. Mm-hmm. So in that instance, that ISO principle that I just talked about would be applicable mm-hmm. in this instance, where it is the reverse of that, where somebody is coming up to me and saying, I do not want to talk to you. I hate people like you. You're the scum of the earth. Fill in the explicit blanks. Right. After that. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to meet them head on excited being like, yeah, absolutely. I hate me too. <laughs> <laughs> right. Why does that get done? That doesn't get anything done. Yeah. Um, it just fuels their anger. <laughs> yeah. Like, this guy's a joker. He's just messing with me. Yeah. So kind of how, how I deal with that is, uh, I am, I employ a tactic that Chris Voss talks about all the time, the mm-hmm. late night FM DJ voice, mm-hmm. which I employed a lot in my therapy, mm-hmm. um, without even knowing that that's what I was doing or that there was a, <laughs> a real estate mogul who (laughs) talked about that. I was like, I know how to do that. I do that all the time. Right. (laughs) So it's just the main thing to realize whenever you have somebody coming at you really aggressively and angry is they probably are not angry at you. They are probably super frustrated because they've gotten 1200 other calls from different people who just talk to them and want to know the information and vomit questions at them and don't really treat them like a human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where you can come in and be different and kind of put yourself ahead of the pack is coming in, understanding this person may be frustrated that I am calling them and I may be the 50th person that they've talked to today about this property. Mm -hmm. When you understand that you can then approach this as I need to be calm. I need to be collected. I need to be understanding and I need to just take what they give me. And then in return, just exude empathy. Mm -hmm. 
and just softness, be calm, be relaxing. Even though inside you may be clenching and you may want to throw hands, you can't verbally do that because you're just going to shut them down. And you're going to lose that lead that you paid for. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So, you know, that's, it's just, it's just really important to try your very best to calm them down, mm -hmm. which doesn't always work. Um, I've had those conversations. For but, sure. For okay. sure. No, I love that. I love that. Just the empathy and, and just the calmness, uh, the understanding. And that's, I think that people, um, they're just not used to that. Uh, people are used yeah. to people not listening to them. Uh, yeah. so they're frustrated about that. Uh, the number one thing people want to talk about is themselves. And if people aren't listening to what they have to say, then, um, that just kind of frustrates them and, and they're not used to being treated like a human. They're used to be right. treated like a transaction. So I love that. Yeah. Uh, two more questions, Wade. So one of the questions is again, like we mentioned, you've been in this for about a year. Uh, what have you learned and how have you grown in, in this particular role? Cause I know you've, yeah, I mean, you're even getting purchase agreements now too. Uh, so yeah. that's been a, that's been a growing area for you to actually, um, go to the close or and close in the purchase agreement, get it under contract. And, uh, but let's talk about you and, uh, how, how have you grown in this role and what can you encourage others to, to, to do to, to grow? Yeah. I mean, I have grown in, I mean, I, I can't even, I can't even pinpoint all of the different areas that I have grown in because, Again, I came in like a blank sheet of paper, so I am full of notes now. Mm -hmm. And so I have grown just exponentially in my knowledge about this field and this way of life. I have never been in a sales position before, so I've grown in my understanding of that, but also my understanding of in order to stand out, you have to be different in the same position that everybody else is already in. Mm -hmm. I think I think I've even grown in in my empathy towards people, um, just because I've had to flex that muscle so much with angry people mm -hmm. um you know and I've, I've just i've grown even within our own company from just starting on the the dead leads to now as you mentioned being able to take that lead from start to finish all the way to the purchase agreement um, so and i think i've just been eager to learn mm -hmm. um, and the biggest thing for me to be able to do that and to have the the desire to do that was just understanding that there are people that I'm going to be under who know more than me, who have expertise and can share that with me. So I have to leave my biases at the door, whatever they may be, to be, like you said in the very, very beginning, coachable. Mm -hmm. uh, because as much as I think I may know, or as much as I think I may be able to do at the end of the day, I have to be, I have to submit my own thoughts and processes and everything like that to the the people that I work for, to the authorities that I work for and, and the processes that they have in place. Mm -hmm. Be able to learn. Amen. Uh, so yeah. I love that. It's awesome. Sounds good, man. I love I love uh this interview. And the last question that I really just want to just kind of have is what what's your last piece of advice? To, to Indianapolis real estate investors out there. Um, we've talked about this role, how to talk to sellers, how to calm them down, how to understand them. Um, yeah. What's your last piece of advice to some of the other investors you talked about? They might get a 50 other calls. What, what, what could you say to some of these other investors that are also doing this particular role? If I had to put it into, into words, I would say in a world full of wolves, be a sheep. Hmm. Um, and, you know, sheep get a bad rep. They're pretty dumb, but they're also gentle and they're different. Mm -hmm. People that you're talking to have been attacked from all sides by a hundred different cold callers in a hundred different ways. So they've been attacked by the wolves. They're in, they're in the trenches. Um, and in order to stand out, you have to be a sheep. Mm -hmm. You have to be calm. Um, you have to be fluffy. 
<laughs> it's soft. Um, and true. ultimately, at the end of the day, I tell people um, on phone calls that I have in conversations that I have with people, I tell them this line and it works magic. Mm. You have to treat people like people and not a number. Mm. And so I tell people all the, all the time, I said, that's what makes us different. We treat people like people first, numbers later. Mm -hmm. And when you kind of understand that that's what people are looking for, they're looking for care and nurture, uh, nurturing types of people. And they're searching for, ultimately, they're searching for love. Everybody is. And so when you can give them that in a different way and in an, in an area of their lives that they seriously have a negative viewpoint on, which real estate and our, and our specific vein of real estate gets a bad rap all the time with people. Um, so when you can stand out by treating them like a person first, you will go a lot further with people than you will when you have the always be closing mentality. Mm, I love that. That's awesome. Treat people like people. I heard, heard a great story, uh, and this is something that I constantly try try to do is to see people as as a human being. So if someone's like angry, I mean, you you never know exactly what is going on in their life. You never know how they grew up, what their home life was like, what their family life was like. You don't know what's going on, and maybe they're just taking all of that out on you, and and they're tired of people treating them like a transaction, like a number. But if you could see them as a human, I mean, they might be a father or a mother. They um, were a child, uh, right? Um, and I was talking to on my other podcast, the Iron D podcast. Yeah, they just really just kind of hit me. There was a there's an organization called AIM, and they do they work with human trafficking uh, mm -hmm. victims. And they started to work. They developed a gym for young men to help prevent these young men from going into human trafficking and, and starting all that, right? Uh, because they come from really broken homes. And at first, the man uh, that was heading this up didn't really want to do this because he was very angry at these these men, which we should be, right? They're doing the, probably the darkest, evilest thing um, that we can ever think of. Um, but when he saw some of these teen boy boys and saw their broken life and, and they had a father that maybe did this or their older brother is a drug dealer. Right. And, and, and now they're trying, we're trying to not have them get into that. And they started to love these boys and to see them grow up, but you could start to see like, wow, their, their life is so broken. And that was just a quick story, but just to see, like, we don't know exactly what's going on behind the scenes. Um, with some of these, but everybody, no matter who it is, if we can see them as a person and see them and, and love them. So well, this is a wrap with uh, Wade Hodges and with Indie Investor Podcast. I appreciate you being on, buddy. Absolutely. And we'll see you guys soon. Oh, oh, oh.